Um, yeah, so should I jump in? Do people yeah. want like a short bathroom break or? <laughs> I think uh, from on my side, I definitely think, uh, just jump right in, I'd say, unless other people insist otherwise. Yeah, everyone okay? Cool. Um, yeah, how many, uh, I, I, I don't know if you all introduced yourself earlier, but um, how many of you uh, have ever played with electronics before? Anyone? Yeah? So, a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so some of the stuff I'll go over might be kind of simple, but it's really good to see, um, you know, sort of the, just the whole picture. And um, by the end of my time with you, I hope you'll have the confidence that you can download any, any one of hundreds of thousands of projects that are online for free um, and try them out. And there's super simple things and there's super complicated things and uh, you can make use of all of those and I'll, I'll show you how to modify what's there and that's hacking. Uh, hacking what's there to uh, conform to your ideas and then from there you get more ideas and you can see more of what's online and you can just keep learning and playing and growing and you know that's what I've been doing all my life and that's the greatest way to learn. Um, I just uh, three weeks ago got a kitten, and um, he's 15 weeks old now. And I've been watching the process of him playing. Of course, he's playing to learn how to be a vicious killer. <laughs> but uh, I hope we, we, with our play, we can learn to um, make our lives and the lives of those around us much better um, without violence. And it's really easy to do that, as it turns out, and fun. Yeah. So, hey Mitch, um, are you going to dive right into the technical side or can you maybe tell us a little bit of the greater picture of what you see in terms of uh, why you're doing this and how you've seen people go from like nothing to actually thinking of themselves as builders? Uh, were you going to cover any of that or were you just going to do... Uh, yeah, I can go over that. So, um, yeah, let me let me uh, share my screen and... Um, uh, Part of my presentation is a short intro to me and what I do, which fits okay. in very well with um, OSC. And let me click this button. Select and go. Oh wait, first I've got to um, that. Okay, and now I can share that screen, hopefully. Does this work? Nope, not that one. Um, that's the wrong one. Um, PowerPoint slideshow. Okay, how does that look? <laughs> I can have a preview on my yeah. phone. I have my phone. Um, as well, so that looks good. Uh, I can share, I can share um, on the phone. I can do close-ups of some wiring that we'll do later. But the first part of my presentation will be my slides here, which includes some videos and um, me talking about stuff. So if you have any questions along the way, please um, interrupt me. Feel free to just yell. I won't be able to see the chat very well, so please just unmute your mic and yell and say, hey. And any point along the way, it's totally fine to interrupt me. Because um, if, if you have a question about something, chances are other people do too, and I've missed something that's important. Or it's just cool to have more explanation of something you're curious about. OK? Right on. So this on, this on my screen now is real contact information. Please feel free to make use of it anytime for any reason, because I'm way happy to help anyone any way I can. So please ask. Uh, if I can help, I will. And it doesn't have to be about uh, electronics. It can be about anything. I've been depressed for the first half of my life, and I know about that. So if you have questions on that or whatever, I'm totally happy to help in anything that I can help with. Um, yeah. So we're going to go over a lot of things in this presentation. Um, so that's all the stuff in writing, but I have pictures which make it easier. First, I'm going to have an intro about me and then an intro about Arduino. 
and what it is and why it's cool. And uh, then I'll have a simplified model about everything you need to know about electronics. Uh, and, and I mean everything. So uh, normally I have uh, a part of this is about how to solder. I've taught this workshop, uh, I don't know, hundreds of times now since 2008. And um, when I do it live, I also teach people how to solder and people actually make their own Arduino from a kit. And that's um, uh, this, put this together and then we actually use this to do the Arduino stuff. Uh, I'm not going to show how to solder now, but if you want to, you can download my soldering comic book and everything I do is open source. Everything, including how I make a living. So you don't have to be um, uh, just someone doing stuff for fun. That's a fantastic thing to do. Open source is also good as um, Marcin also pointed out, for-profit corporations do it. My corporation is for-profit, but it's really small. It's just me and a few friends. Um, but that's how we all make a living, and it's because it's open source that we're successful. Um, but the comic book is open source, so it's been translated into lots of languages. Um, lots of languages. Feel free to download that. Um, we won't be soldering our own Arduino like this. We'll be making one. I'll show a picture of that um, in a bit. Um, actually, this is it. Um, here, <laughs> can you see that? That's an Arduino board on a bread or an Arduino on a breadboard, and mm -hmm. it works. It's just a few parts and yep. a few minutes of time. So, let's see. That was on the phone. If, I'm going to go over the Arduino software, which is also free and open source. Uh, super easy to download on Mac OS, Windows, or Linux. And then I'll show you the simplest program and how to hack that. And if you can do that, then you can hack any of the Arduino programs. And you do not need to have ever programmed ever in your life to be able to hack on Arduino programs. Arduino uh, was created so that non-geeky artists, that was the original idea, non-geeky artists could use their this kind of technology, computer chips, to do all sorts of cool art. And they didn't want it to be scary, they wanted it to be easy and inviting, so they changed the names of a lot of things um, in order to make it less scary and more inviting to non-geeky artists. Like, this is a program on the screen right now. Um, but the Arduino people don't call it a program. They call programs sketches, because artists don't program, they sketch, right? So I think that's actually silly. But if you play with Arduino, you've got to know these things. And it's OK. So this is an Arduino sketch. If you can, um, if you can type uh, with a finger, then you can hack on uh, Arduino sketches, Arduino programs. Then I'll show you how to use a solderless breadboard which is a way cool tool for putting projects together very quickly without soldering. And um, it's not permanent, but you can plug parts in and try things and see what works and what doesn't and make it as cool as you want to. Once you get it the way you want, if you don't touch it and you're not too rough with it, it can stay working for a long time. But if you want it to be more permanent, then you can get a solder breadboard. And if you know how to solder, then you can make it permanent. Um, but you, with a solderless breadboard, you can do something simple like just make an LED blink. Or if you know how to read a schematic, which might look kind of scary right here if you've never seen a schematic before, but I'll show you that it's actually really easy. And once you know how to read a schematic, then you can take the information here and put it on the breadboard like this. And that's a TV Be Gone remote control, which I'll explain in, in a little bit. But if you can make this, and I'll show you how to make this as an example project, um, just one out of hundreds of thousands or millions uh, of projects. If you can do this, you can do anything with electronics, just playing more. And if you remain interested, whatever motivates you, if you continue to be motivated, you can continue to play and learn and do more and more complicated things. But with just a few concepts, which you'll know by the end of this workshop, you can do an outrageously cool, uh, a large number of cool things. So um, after we go through all that, then I'll show you how you can make your own Arduino on a solderless breadboard 
so that you can um, you don't have to buy one. Although nowadays buying an Arduino is incredibly cheap, but why order stuff all the way from China if you can do stuff at home? So, anyways, um, after you make an Ar uh, a TV gong, uh, which you'll be able to do by the end of the workshop, definitely, then you can go all over the world wherever you are and turn TVs off in public places. That's what TV Be Gone does. And if you can turn TVs off in public places, not only does your own life get better, but everyone in the room's life suddenly gets much, much better. So um, for some reason, TVs are on everywhere in the world. And the thing is, they need to be off. And um, yeah, it's up to us to do that. <laughs> so um, that's what we're going to go over today. Are there any questions just about, about that? Any questions? Yeah. So far, so good for me. Anyone? Are you, do you think that you're showing video through your phone because we can't see you and your presentation at the same time? Oh, you, you didn't see any of my presentation? Because I have two videos. No. Oh. We saw your, um, we saw your slides, but we didn't see your your body and your gestures while you were presenting the slides. Oh yeah, I guess my my video's off when um, when the slides are being presented. Well, yeah, it's yeah, me it then on the phone. <laughs> That's right. So what I I'm actually recording on my screen. I do catch Mitch's presentation and his cell phone, but the cell phone right now is seems to be dark. So yeah. can possibly oh it. yeah, I, I, it's um. Let's see. Let me unmute my video there. Okay. Yeah. Now I can see okay. it on the, the phone part and the presentation part. So I'm recording that in case you can't see it on your end. Okay. Um. Yeah. So uh, let's see. I need to set up the phone so that it actually. Um. I don't know. Can you? I can't. I don't see a preview of me. Am I in that, or am I cut your off? Your head. Your head is cut off a little higher. My head's cut off. Yeah. Okay. Po Pointed a little higher. This looks like a job for three D printing. Yeah, three D printed stand will do it. <laughs> uh, it's too high into the ceiling right now. Right now, I could see you. Right now, right now is good. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Good. There. That's you're in um, it right now. Let's see. Yeah, I think I need. I think this is a job for a little bit of duct tape. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> okay, is, how's that? Yeah, perfect. Good. Okay, great. So now you can see me and my uh, my my crazy hair and whatever. So um, the main thing now is the slides, anyways. But. Um, um, but seeing me smile is always wonderful. Yep. So um, <laughs> uh, let me uh, just say a bit about me and some of my philosophy, which um, overlaps with uh, Martin's very well, I think, uh, which is why we're playing together today. So um, I've been a, a geek all my life. And um, uh, like I said earlier, I, the first half of my life was like totally depressed and I was a TV addict, and uh, I tried to escape my pain into television. I just watched TV all the time. I eventually uh, quit TV and all these other things that I did to try to avoid my pain. That was when I was 25, and it took many years, but I eventually learned to live a life I love living. And um, <clears throat> uh, in 2003, I actually ended up quitting all of the work that I did, which was kind of cool. I did lots of cool things as a consultant. Um, you know, I was one of the people who created virtual reality. It was all an accident, but we created virtual reality and coined, coined the phrase virtual reality because it didn't exist in 1986. And, um, and I worked on voice recognition and uh, video graphics generation before there were video cards. And that was also in the 80s. Um, you know, in the 90s, I, I, by the time the 90s came around, I'd worked for lots and lots of small companies most of which failed, and I saw they made all sorts of cool, uh, stupid mistakes, not cool mistakes, way stupid mistakes. And I thought, well, you know, I can make stupid mistakes on my own. And uh, so I, I started my own company and made lots of stupid mistakes. But somehow um, it didn't go out of business, and it was successful. 
and that was in Silicon Valley in the 90s, the late 90s, and, and then I started consulting again, and uh, I quit all that because none of it was super exciting to me. It was cool, but it wasn't exciting. It wasn't pas my passion. Um, so I quit all that to explore what it might be that I was passionate about. And um, I didn't know what that would be or how I would continue to make money to support myself. But it turned out that this way weird idea about turning TVs off in public places um, was the thing that ended up making me uh, a living. And it was a project that I was just obsessed with uh, in the year that I gave myself to explore. way I've me and a few friends have made a living for 17 years kind of kind of cool so um, uh, yeah and then in 2007 because of TV be gone I was invited to lots and lots of places to give talks and one of the places I was uh, invited to give a talk was a hacker conference and I'd never really heard of hacker conferences before I've heard the word hacker used in good ways and bad ways um, but what do you do at a hacker conference? Well, it turns out that it's thousands of people coming together to uh, share what they know with one another. And it was super wonderful to be in a place where almost everyone does what they love doing uh, rather than what most people do not at hacker conferences, which is struggle just to get by. And I wanted more of that. And I had to wait till the next hacker conference and my third hacker conference there was a talk about how to start your own hacker space and that was really inspiring to me because then there could be this physical place in my hometown where I could go any time of day or night and meet cool people doing cool things and teaching and learning and sharing and doing all of that together and I was inspired to do that so I did that with a bunch of other friends and we created noise bridge which is that round red circle um, that's our logo and it became one of the first uh, U.S. hackerspaces, an early hackerspace in the U.S. And it became an example for others to follow. And um, yeah, and it's still going. It's, um, there's a lot of long stories there, but I won't go into that. Um, but from doing that, I continue to get uh, invited to give lots and lots of talks, big ones and small ones. And, um, uh, and I started teaching people how to solder, which I did at maker fairs and hacker conferences all over the world and all sorts of other conferences and also at schools and at libraries. And uh, uh, since I manufacture in China, I started doing it in China as well and meeting people in the Ministry of Education in China. Uh, and there they wanted to improve the Chinese education system so that people could actually learn rather than just take tests. And that started spreading to other places in the world. So yeah, that's another thread of my life is um, um, helping education become better. So um, yeah, so I've been giving talks and workshops all over the world as a result and encouraging people to do things open source so that others can learn from what they do and so that people can explore and find things that they can make a living, hopefully doing what they love rather than something that's just a way to make money, which is, I think, um, um, a waste of human energy. Uh, we can do so much more if we have time and energy uh, to do things that we feel are important and if we can make money enough money and and get enough other resources doing what we love to keep doing living our lives including doing what we love like what could be better and that's what I would love to see all of you do <laughs> if not next week then at least uh, uh, sometime soon and certainly before you die because while we're alive is the only chance we have to live our lives and um, when we're dead, we don't have a chance anymore. So you're alive right now. So it's time to do cool shit in your life. <laughs> so, um, and so I mentor people all over the world as well. Um, I have that little uh, uh, thing in the bottom of my screen. Uh, be a happy worker. Um, we don't have to just struggle to make uh, enough money and get enough resources to live our lives. It's not necessarily true that everyone has the opportunities to do this, but if you can make the opportunities, make the time, explore, do cool stuff, do that on your own, do that with other people, form communities, find communities, 
you know, that's why we're here together. It'd be much, much, much cooler if we were actually here in person, but such are the case, such is such are the, <laughs> the times of pandemics. So we do what we can, and we're lucky enough to be in a, a live in a time when there's lots of cool technology that we can make use of. So um, here's my contact information again. I do not live in San Francisco anymore. That's an old address. Uh, I now live in Berlin, uh, where I'm talking from right now. Um, but that's my contact information. Otherwise, feel free to call me, email me anytime for any reason. I also have a free service, which I encourage all of you to make use of. Um, if you ever find yourself in a position where you don't like your job, please contact me. I am really good into talking people into quitting jobs they don't like. <laughs> So um, lots of people have taken me up on that, and no one's complained yet. So a lot of people's lives have improved by doing that. And it's scary, though. I know it's scary because I've done it. Um, but is it's way really worth trying. Is contact you through email, or how, how do we take advantage of that service? Email, email uh, is maybe the best way. You can also, that phone number there on the card is um, uh, my signal and telegram and SMS, and, and it works for voice, too. Mm. So, um, yeah, so other, yeah, so I'm easy to get. I'm all over the internet. <laughs> so, so grab me any way you like. Cool. cool. So I, I teach workshops. Here's me teaching 50 people how to solder. And um, it's fun to come together with people and learn. And that's what we're doing here today. So see, these people are happy. And they're only learning how to blink a light. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't take much to make people happy. Um, yeah, so um, uh, let me talk a, a bit about um, uh, an intro to Arduino. Arduino is based on a, a computer chip, and the technical word for a computer chip is microcontroller. Um, a microcontroller is just a computer on a chip. And this, that picture um, is... Um, um, doesn't give the size. Here's the actual size of the thing. <laughs> you can see um, that's the same computer chip, and there's there's like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of these things. They all have a name. None of them are happy names, but this one's name is 18 Mega 328P, and that's what's on the least expensive Arduino boards. And this is a microcontroller, like many others. It's a complete computer on a chip, and all it does like all computers, is run programs. That's all any computer does. No matter how big or small the computer is, it just runs a program. Um, the computer chips, microcontrollers, run a program that control parts connected to the chip's pins. That's what um, microcontrollers do. They, um, they have a program that runs to control the parts connected to its pins. And what you can do with that is something simple like this uh, video here. Is the video showing? Yeah. Um, you can see it's just blinking a light. Just like this one. <laughs> and um, that's the simplest thing you can do with a microcontroller. But you can also do complicated things. So here's uh, another project. Um, it shows up. Yeah, that didn't work too well. But um, here's another one. So that's uh, a project of mine. I make a bunch of uh, kits, electronic kits, so that people of all ages and any skill level can learn to solder and make something cool. So the project that didn't, the video didn't play was just blinking lights that make colored lights that follow your hands. It's kind of like a weird art project. So you can have waves of color following your waving hands, and it's kind of fun. The music synthesizer kit is Arduino-based. So you can use the free Arduino software to reprogram in different sounds. So you can play all sorts of different music. You can make beautiful sounds. You can make nasty noise. You can do all sorts of cool things. So um, you know, 
those are just some of my projects. Uh, of course, TV Be Gone is another project, and I have a kit for that. I don't make any money doing the kits. I just do that because I love making these things available to other people so they can learn from it. But microcontrollers are really cheap. They're really powerful. And so they are in almost anything nowadays. Of course, they're in microwave ovens. They're in um, drones. They're in digital watches. Um, they're in cars and cameras. They're in robots. Um, they're, of course, in TVs. Um, and uh, they allow the TV to do, the modern TVs to do everything that they do. And fortunately, they're also in remote control so that we can turn the TVs off to make the world better for ourselves and everyone around us. TV Be Gone is my favorite project. <laughs> um, it's just a remote control. And it's a remote control like any other, except remote controls, as you can see here, have all of those buttons. All of those buttons are useless. Like, why are all those buttons there? When you have a TV, the only button you need is the off button. So TV Gone is a remote control with just the off button. And the off button, though, unlike a normal remote control, which only works on one TV, the one button on a TV Be Gone works for all TVs. So you push it, and it'll turn every TV off. It's a very, very simple project. It's just a microcontroller and five other parts, including a button and a battery. And uh, remote controls work with invisible light called infrared. And uh, the tip of the the tip of the micro uh, the tip of the TV be gone, where you can see the weird trippy uh, yellow and blue stripes coming out. That's an infrared light, an infrared LED transmitting off codes first from the most popular TV, which is Sony, and then the second most popular, which is Philips, and then the third most popular, which is Panasonic, and on and on and on until it goes through all of the TVs and then it turns itself off, waiting for you to push that button again to make the world a better place for everybody. Right? So that's TV Gone, and I'm going to show you how that works. And that's, again, just an example. Um, once you see how TV Begone works, you have enough information you can do hundreds of thousands of way, way cool projects. Even if you don't think TV Begone is cool, I don't understand why anyone but if you don't think it's cool, it gives you the information anyway so that you can do your own cool thing. Um, That was just a few seconds of a video of some high school kids who made use of my open source TV Begone project to do their science, um, their science project in a physics class. Uh, and they went to a Best Buy, which is a big department store in the United States, uh, and turned off all their TVs and they videoed it. So if you're interested, you can just search on, on YouTube uh, or on your favorite browser and you can find lots and lots and lots of videos of people turning TVs off with TV Begone. Um, anyways, the TV Gone doesn't have this microcontroller. It has a different microcontroller, um, but it's um, it's they're all basically the same thing. They're a computer on a chip, um, and they um, can be programmed to control the parts connected to its pins. On a TV Gone, those parts um, are controlled to turn TVs off. In a microwave, there's other parts connected to heat up food. In a car, there's lots and lots and lots of microcontrollers to control various aspects of the car, including fuel injection, um, including climate control, entertainment systems, whatever. Um, that's the idea. The microcontroller has parts connected to its pins, and the program controls those parts to do so. So, how do you connect parts to its pins, and how do you control them? Well, one way to do that is to be a geek and to spend your life learning how to do that. And that's what I did. <laughs> but nowadays, it's much, much easier. You can make use of an Arduino board, for instance. And there are a lot of other boards as well. So Arduino has the microcontroller. And on the edge of the board, you can see those holes, those connectors with holes on the top and the bottom. Those are um, 
holes, you could push a part or a wire into those holes and it automatically through the board connects to the pins. It's super easy to connect the parts to the uh, microcontroller that way. Wait for the slides to catch up. And then, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone knows. Uh, in the U.S., the um, in the U.S., it's called twenty-four gauge. Um, and if you go to um, AliExpress or any electronics uh, website or store, if you can find one, um, then you can just say you want wires uh, that can be used as jumper wires for solderless breadboards, and it, they're really, really cheap and. Um, and there you get lots of them for just a dollar or a euro or for like three three dollars or three euros or the equivalent in Chinese currency or whatever and um, um, yeah so um, that's easy and then all the electronic parts have wires which are within the range that fit in uh, almost all the parts are within the range of fitting into an Arduino board and a solderless breadboard and then to put the to, to, to have the program to control those parts, um, most microcontrollers, including the one on the Arduino board, the ATmega328P, um, you put it into its memory. And the memory is the equivalent of a hard drive on a microcontroller chip, on a computer chip. So, um, and the uh, Arduino board either has a USB controller chip or you can have a, um, for a, a lot of copies of Arduino boards, you can have um, an external, an external uh, cable like this one here, uh, which has a USB chip on it that you can use for all of your Arduino boards that don't have it. So I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more later. And with that and the free Arduino software, you can upload a program into the Arduino, one that has already been written by someone else, or one that you wrote from scratch, or one that you modified from someone else's program, one that you hacked from someone else's program. And that is trivial, and I'll show you how to do that after my electronics presentation. So Arduino Corporation is a for-profit corporation. Um, a lot of people make a living with the Arduino Corporation, um, but they make lots and lots of boards. Really little ones, really big ones, some with a lot of pins that you connect parts to, um, some with um, just a few pins, uh, and they are various prices. You can do almost anything you want to do with the cheapest Arduino board, which is called an Arduino Uno. And that's what we're going to be using today. And um, the Arduino boards are all blue like this. But Arduino is open source. They encourage people to copy it. And because people copy it, lots and lots and lots more Arduino boards are in the world, which means lots and lots and lots more Arduino projects are in the world for people to download for free, which makes more people aware of Arduino which makes many more people buy the original Arduino boards, and there's tens of millions of those in the world, and there's even more of the copies. And the copies are called clones. And uh, the board that I showed you before, which is right here in my phone, um, the yellow board is made by me and my friend Tully. Um, he lives in China and has access to lots of cool resources there, and he made this board for me for my workshops that we people can solder together. But lots of people make clones, and um, they're really, really cheap now, like three euros. Um, yeah, and they come in all shapes and sizes. And the cool thing with open source is people usually, sometimes people just copy, just, just total copy, and that's fine. But lots of times people change it to make it better for their specific use, or they change it to make it cool for a more broad general use. And all of that has happened with Arduino as well. And as a result, there are hundreds of thousands of projects online. 
I just did a quick search and took a screenshot and shrank the screen so I could see more. These are just like maybe 50 or, or 70 or so projects, but there are hundreds of thousands of them. Anything from blinking lights to flying machines to uh, robots um, to silly things like making your toilet tweet when it flushes, anything you can think of is probably already done. And if it isn't, something like it probably is, and maybe one one part of this project and another part of uh, this project, and you can all combine that to make yours. Plus, maybe you have to do some parts on your own. Um, and with just a, a, some information, which I'll show you in this workshop, plus learning on your own, you can do anything. So, um, yeah, that's the one me and Tully, my friend in China, make. Um, but that's. Um, that's pretty much uh, what Arduino is and why I think it's cool and hopefully you do too. So any questions on what Arduino is and why it's cool and why you might want to use it? Everyone's okay? Great. Okay, so let's jump in um, and learn about electronics. Electronics is awesome. Um, I've been playing with it all my life, and um, you can do magic with it. It's total magic. These parts, um, you can just connect them together in various ways to do almost anything you, you can think of from your imagination. So it's a way of taking something from your imagination, using a model which is purely conceptual, you know, just in your head, and then create something in our physical world to actually change the physical world. Of course, you can build horrible things like bombs, um, but you can make wonderful things to make music. You can make all sorts of things to make people's lives better. Um, just from an idea, we can use these really cheap little parts to change the world, and that's magic. And you don't have to be uh, a magician who's trained all of their life you don't have to go to university for 12 years like I did. Um, um, although it's nothing wrong with that. You can do that. I did it. I had a lot of fun. I also wasted a lot of time. But um, uh, with just a few concepts and playing around a bit, you can do amazingly cool, awesome magic. Electronics is named after electrons. Electrons are, uh, according to quantum, these particles that don't exist. But they have a bunch of energy flying around an atom, which also, uh, an atom's nucleus, which also doesn't exist. But the electrons, which don't exist, have a probability of existing in a certain spot in space with a certain amount of energy, sort of maybe. We will, we will not be using quantum today. Um, we'll just consider them to be teeny little particles that have some charge, some energy. And um, we can push them around to make them do what we want. And the thing that's cool with electrons is that they love being pushed around. See, in this picture right here, the electrons are being pushed around in a circle. And they go around and around and around. And see, they're smiling. That's because they like being pushed around. And if you can have the electrons going around and around and around in this circle, uh, in a complete path with no break in the path, that is what does all of the magic. That's called a circuit. That's the technical definition of a circuit. You've all heard that word before. That's actually what it means in, in, the, in electronics. So electrical engineers um, are actually really insecure people. So they've made up lots of words, some of which we use in everyday life, most of which we don't. And they try to confuse people with it because they think if people are confused that they'll have job security. But I'm going to go over some of this stuff so that you won't be confused by it. It's actually totally easy. So we push electronics around and around, and these things that don't even exist, that just come from our imagination, can change the physical world to make the world change, hopefully for the better. So. Um, these obstacles in their path are electronic parts. As the electrons go uh, uh, around and through those obstacles, each part, depending on what it is, has some energy to do cool things. 
And if the parts are connected in the right way, then the project does something cool and the world becomes a better place. Okay, so how do we push those electrons around? You have to have a thing to do that, and that's an electronic part also. And that's called a power supply. There's all sorts of forms of power supplies. Uh, in this picture, we see some of them, like an old power supply from a desktop in the lower left. Um, the upper left is a power supply for a laptop. The wall that you plug something into, that's a European wall socket. Uh, AC, that's a lot of power. That can kill people if you use it improperly. Um, so we're not going to use that today. We're going to use batteries, which are another great power supply. AA batteries. And you can have one of them, or two or three or four or twelve, whatever. You can put them in a battery pack, like on the lower right, um, to have as many of them to have the appropriate amount of power. And um, here is, um, oops, <laughs> uh, um, I have one of those right here, <laughs> powering my Arduino board. Um, and I just, I've been using it to hold my phone up. Am I still, it looks like I'm okay then. So um, uh, yeah, and it has an on-off switch, so you can turn the power on and off. Um, one AA battery has a lot of energy to push electrons around. And if you look on the AA battery, you can see on the uh, upper right of the battery, there's a little plus sign. A little plus sign. Um, that means it's the plus side of the battery. And on the uh, lower side, the left side of the battery is a minus sign. And if you put, uh, oh yeah, and then uh, on the battery, under where it says alkaline, under the E, you can see it says 1.5V. V. That stands for volts. That's the amount of push a AA battery can give electrons. One and a half volts. So that's a lot of volts. And it can push electrons around. But you can see in the battery pack, I've got three of them. So that's three one and a half volt batteries. And uh, OK, so I'm going to get into a bit of math now. There won't be much math in today's presentation, but here's some math. One AA battery is one and a half volts. If we have three of them, that's three times one and a half volts. That's four and a half volts. OK, I hope that wasn't too hard. That's the math for today. OK, so uh, here, though, is one. Oh, I forgot to mention. Back to. Um, battery. Um, <clears throat> Volts is named after Alexander Volta. He is a dead physicist. We name everything in electronics that we're dead physicists. So Volts, Alexander Volta, he did a lot of cool things. Or nowadays, for most people, if they've heard it at all, is Volts, the amount of push we can give electrons. Okay, so here's Here's electrons being pushed around with one AA battery. The AA battery pushes the electrons around and around and around. And depending on the, um, depending on the obstacles in their path, the electrons in this circle, in this circuit, are going at a particular speed. The speed of the electrons is called current, measured in amps. And that's named after André-Marie Ampère, another dead physicist. So amps is just a measurement of the current. And current is just the speed of the electrons. So amps is just the speed of the electrons. If we have one amp, that's a really fast electrons spinning around and around and around. But if we have two amps, it's twice as fast. If we have three amps, it's three times as fast as one amp. right? So one and a half volts can push current, push electrons around that's that's current measured in amps okay so um if we have the battery pack though with three double a batteries with four and a half volts that's pushing the electrons around with three times the push three times the volts three times the push so it's going three times as fast all those electrons are spinning around and around and around three times as fast as with one double a battery which means we have three times the current, three times the amount of amps. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Great. So now, we'll talk about one more concept, and then you have the basics of all of electronics. 
we if you have electrons spinning around and around that are going too fast they have too much energy for some parts some parts are sensitive and they might burn up if they burn up smoke goes away and sometimes we call that letting the magic smoke out of a part and once the once the magic smoke is released you cannot put the magic smoke back in the part so you, we don't usually don't want to do that so there are parts whose only job it is is to slow down electrons to resist the flow of electrons to resist the current to limit the current and those parts are called resistors resistors slow down the flow of electrons they slow down they limit the current less amps okay so that happy person in a mud bath at the top that represents a resistor so you can see the the resistor or the the electron the happy electron of course they're happy the happy electron to the left of the mud bath uh, that electron is just about to get into the mud and once they get into the mud even though they're running really quick lots of amps it slows that electron down and the electrons are actually super 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 close to one another so the one behind it is slowed down to the exact same speed and the one behind it and the one behind it and the one behind it all of the electrons in the complete circle in the complete circuit are slowed down the same amount by that resistor okay so that's what resistors do they're like a happy person in a mud bath for the electrons they slow down those electrons and i want to point out that it doesn't matter if the electron if the resistor is a little bit shifted to the left it's still the same circuit the resistors are still going the exact same speed whether the elect uh, whether the resistor was in its original spot or shifted over a little bit they can be even over here off to the right they can also be underneath it's one circle so it doesn't matter where that resistor is it's the same circuit the happy person on the same amount you can be over there too so um, now you have all of the basics of electronics, and that's called Ohm's Law. It took me four and a half years of university to learn Ohm's Law, but now you've gotten that in about 45 minutes. Um, Ohm's Law is this relationship that you now know. If you push on electrons with volts, they move. They move fast, and the speed is amps, current measured in amps, and resistance um, uh, uh, slows them down. Oh, and I didn't mention, of course, Ohm. He's a dead physicist. He's the he's the unit of uh, of resistance. So Georg Ohm figured all of this shit out a long time ago. And we name it now with all of the dead physicists Ohm's law. So that relationship you now know. But it's also stated with math. I won't be using this today, but you should be aware of it. Volts equals amps times ohms. Okay, and mm -hmm. electrical engineers, being insecure as they are, they don't say V equals A times R. They say E mm -hmm. equals I times R as it shows there. Can you see that on the bottom? I don't know if the videos. OK, cool. So um, E, dead physicists a long time ago didn't call them volts and amps times uh, and, and, and ohms because they weren't dead yet. So they called it electromotive <laughs> force, intensity, and resistance. So uh, E equals I times R. Um, and if you play with electronics, you'll probably see that written. But with, when you just take projects that are online, People have either figured this out with Ohm's law to figure out resistors and volts and amps and all this stuff, or they just use a solderless breadboard and they tinkered around to make it work. And that's a perfectly valid way of doing engineering. Um, but if you're going to be doing complicated projects, eventually, if you keep playing with this, 
you do want to know Ohm's law and be able to use it because uh, you want to be sure that something won't fail at a critical time. If you're an artist, you know, you've got 3,000 people at your installation, you don't want it to break with magic smoke going away, right? So um, you want to be able to prove mathematically that it'll work. Or if something is um, uh, critical in space or for someone's life support system, etc. So whatever. Um, ohms, uh, volts are V, uh, current is uh, A, and uh, resistance isn't R, it's uh, O for ohms, but we don't use O because that looks like a zero. We use the Greek letter omega, and that looks like a horseshoe here, the capital letter omega. And that cartoon is just something I thought was weirdly funny, a geek humor. So, uh, so I show you. Too. Um, resistors look like this. Um, the big resistors. Nowadays, with modern electronics, they're actually very, very small. They're like sometimes even smaller than uh, the tip of a very sharp pencil. Um, but most resistors, the bigger resistors have, you can see the one all the way to the right, that, that whitish block. There's four, and you can see the horseshoe there, four ohms. The big black one says uh, 180 ohms. And then the ones all to the left have colored bands on them. Those colored bands with uh, the normal uh, resistors with wires coming out of them, that's called color code to tell you how many ohms they have. And nowadays, unlike when I was a kid, you don't have to memorize the color code chart. You can just ask the internet and it will tell you. In many projects, they already show you uh, the color code, so and it just says so. Um, but it's kind of fun to learn color codes because they're colorful, it's cool. Okay, so you should be aware of that. Um, most parts, um, oh yeah, so you now know some parts. I'm gonna show you just a few more parts. And if you know those few parts, um, put them together in some cool ways, then you can do anything. So, and I'm gonna use TV Be Gone to show you how to do that. But uh, before we get to some new parts, let's go over the parts we already show, uh, already know uh, with a little more information. A power supply, if it's batteries, um, have a plus and a minus side. That because, that's because it matters which way you connect it to your circuit. So a battery pack has a red and a black wire to show you the plus and the minus. If you hook it up wrong, you know what happens? Uh, things flow, but they flow in the wrong direction. And magic smoke might go away, or things might heat up. If you hook up the batteries, uh, the battery pack to uh, the ATmega328P microcontroller, it gets so hot that if you touch it, even for a quarter of a second, you'll get a blister. Um, but these chips are very well uh, made. They're very robust, so if you let it cool down again, it'll work again <laughs> every time. It's kind of amazing. But um, you usually don't want to do that either. So you want to be aware that you must hook up the power supply the right way, which is why they have a red wire and a black wire, so you can hook it up correctly. And I'll show you that uh, how to do that really soon. But if it matters how to connect a, power su uh, a part, whether it's a power supply or another part, that part is said to be polarized and it has polarity. Okay, so the power supply, a battery power supply is polarized. It has polarity. It matters how you hook it up. So here is that circuit again with the happy electrons going around and around and around. You can see on the, on the, on the picture that the power supply switch is on. So the electrons are being pushed in the correct direction with the black wire on the left and the red wire on the right in this, in this circuit. Okay, the black wire is minus. The red wire is plus. And that's not because red means plus by some objective aspect of the universe. It's just convention. Okay, so not always but almost always in electronics, red is signifier of plus and black of minus. Okay? 
So, um, and we have to be aware with a pie, we want the red wire and the black wire to go the correct place. And uh, every project might be a little different that way, but we want the red to be plus and the black to be minus. And electronic engineers are insecure, like I've said a few times. So we don't call the red wire just the red wire. We have different names for it. We don't call the black wire just the red black wire. We have different names for it. So the red wire is also called power. It's also called plus or positive. Sometimes it's just given the name uh, of how many volts are there. This is a four and a half volt battery pack. So we can call it four and a half V, four and a half volts. Or a lot of times and quite often it's called VCC, the, the CC voltage. And that's left over from the old days of vacuum tubes, as they called them in America, or uh, valves, as they called them in uh, English in the UK. Um, those old things that glowed inside of radios in the 1940s and 50s um, uh, and are still used for some things today. Um, so the CC voltage, so those are words that you'll hear to talk about the red wire. The black wire is called minus or negative, sometimes zero volts. But most often, it's called ground. So you definitely need to know that word, ground. And it's called ground because dead physicists a long time ago saw that there was um, an analogy between height and voltage. So if I say that this is um, uh, uh, 30 centimeters, what does that mean? It means 30 centimeters from the tabletop. But from the ground, it's like uh, uh, 130 centimeters. We need a reference point, and the reference point is usually the ground. And it's the same with voltage. So if the red wire is 4.5 volts, it's 4.5 volts from the black wire, from the ground. Cool? So ground is really important. What does, what does CC stand for? Uh, it doesn't really stand for anything. It was the third voltage in a circuit, which was the most important in a vacuum tube. So you had um, the cathode voltage, uh, and then you had the grid voltage, and then you had some other voltages. But the, 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 um, the anode voltage um, uh, was the, the VCC. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, the third one, and it's just sort of stuck around. Most people in electronics don't even know that. But it, sure. Uh, coming out of the black wire. So does the electron flow, even though the red wire is called power, is the electrons like flowing initially from the black or the red? And like, yeah, this always confuses yeah, me about DC opposed to AC. Um, but um, yeah, if you could answer that. Yeah, so for AC, it doesn't matter because it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. DC, um, it also doesn't matter. But if you want to keep it in your mind, just choose one direction and keep it consistent. A long time ago, um, the dead physicists, uh, they, when they were alive, um, they thought that electrons were positively charged. That was the model. But it turned out that the model worked better for physics to call the electrons negatively charged and the uh, nucleus positive charge. Um, so they had the electrons coming out of the red wire and going the other direction. But with uh, the physicists that are now dead and the model of the electron the way it is now, um, in physics, they have the electrons flowing out of the black wire and into the red. But it really doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. So in modern electronics, we usually consider it to be out of black wire and into the red. Um, but it actually doesn't matter because the model for electronics works either way. But you just have to be consistent. You don't want it shown coming out of the red wire into the black on another part of your circuit. Um, in a more complicated circuit, like this circuit here has two electronic parts plus the power supply. Um, and it's just one circle. But in all uh, projects that are useful, there are actually lots of circles. And they can all be powered from one power supply. And they'll interact with one another as well, um, quite often. 
So you know, if you want to think about it in your head, it's like water flowing through pipes in a certain direction. The electrons are like the water droplets flowing through, through a pipe. And um, you, know, you just want to think that it comes out of the pump and then suck back into the other side of the pump. Got it. So in modern Got it. electronics, we'd say it comes out of the black wire and into the red. But you can think of it the other way too. It's totally fine. Cool? Yeah. Great. So uh, back to uh, resistors. Resistors are not polarized. Resistors can work just the, exactly the same, whether they're like this or like this. The happy person in a mud bath is the same happy person in a mud bath, slowing down the electrons the same this way or upside down. The resistors are not polarized. They work exactly the same either way. OK, so let's look at another part. This part is polarized. So it has a plus side and a minus side. These are diodes. Diodes are um, uh, parts that ensure that electrons only flow in one direction. Electrons can go in a diode one way and flow almost as if the diode isn't even there in one direction. But in the other direction, they, they can't go. They can't go that way at all. That's what diodes do. So um, diodes are used for a bunch of different things. But normally in electronics, we don't use diodes so often. But we do use a special kind of diode. And you've all seen this millions of times in your life, whether you're aware of it or not. It's a special kind of diode that when the electrons flow in the directions they can flow, meaning the current is flowing in the direction that it can flow through the diode, they emit light, which is why these special kinds of diodes are called light emitting diodes, D for short. OK, but they are diodes. Oh, yeah, back, back to uh, uh, this one. Um, <clears throat> so the, the regular diodes are um, um, polarized, so it matters which way you put them in. They have a bar on one side. It doesn't matter what the color is. The bar is the minus side. Okay, and again, so like, I'm going through all of this stuff. I want you to have a feel for how this works. You don't have to memorize all of this. If you want to take notes, it's totally fine. These slides that I'm going to show you, I'm, uh, you can download them later. Uh, I have a, um, uh, a link I'll show you, and uh, I can put it in the chat as well so you can get it easier. Um, so you can download all this. So I want you to have a feel for uh, electronics so that you um, you know, the feel is the main thing, not, there's a lot of information I've given you, don't need to memorize it. The things that are important, I repeat, and that's how we learn, is through repetition. Okay, so, yeah. For now, don't worry about it. Um, <clears throat> in different kinds of electronic circuits, you do things for different reasons. And I'm not really going to go over that today, because there's a lot of other information that I'm going to give you, and that's like just a little bit more advanced. Um, so for now, just know that there's a plus and a minus side, <clears throat> and the people who do design the circuit do it in a certain way. You are going to see how to hook up an LED, though, which will answer that question at least uh, in a practical way for today. Is that okay? Great. So an LED is a diode. Electrons only flow in one way. Current only flows in one way. Those two statements were exactly the same, using the different words. Um, current flows into the minus and out the plus, using the modern version of electronics, modern model of electronics. So um, how do you know which is the plus side and the minus side? There's two wires coming out of an LED. One of them is short and one is long. The short lead is minus, negative. The long is plus, positive. And um, also, again, with the insecurities of electrical engineers, they don't call wires coming out of parts wires. They call them leads. So 
they lead to the part. So there's a long lead and a short lead. The short lead is minus. So we always call them leads. And on a chip, they're often called pins, and maybe on some others. So they're either leads or pins on parts. Okay. So LEDs come in lots of colors. You cannot change that color. They're manufactured with modern semiconductor physics, and that take quant takes quantum, um, to be a certain color. You can have LEDs that have red, green, and blue, and with different amounts of brightness for red, green, and blue, you can change the color. But a single LED has one color that are, that's determined by the manufacturer. It can be red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, whatever. It can also be white. Um, and that's done, and it's done with lots and lots of different things. It can also be invisible light. So light above violet is called ultraviolet. We, it's light. It shines on things, but our eyeballs can't see it. But if it shines on some uh, uh, materials, they fluoresce. It looks like they're glowing in the dark, and normally in Eng American English, that's called a black light. Um, and if you go to um, um, uh, uh, a weird store in a mall, you might see uh, Jimi Hendrix on black velvet glowing under a black light. That's ultraviolet. Um, and there's also uh, oh, an ultraviolet coming from the sun in huge, huge, powerful energy version of ultraviolet gives you sunburn. It burns your skin. Um, uh, especially if you have very wet well, like me. Um, so I have to be careful with that. But an LED with ultraviolet, there's no way you can get hurt. There's not enough energy there to do anything uh, harmful. And similarly for infrared, which is below red, that's light that we cannot see, but it is light, it can shine on things. And the sun has very, very large amount of energy of infrared as well, and that is absorbed in your skin and that's why it feels hot <laughs> except in berlin in winter so um, um infrared is invisible light that is used in remote controls for televisions and you blink that infrared with very very short intervals but very specific intervals on and off and on and off at just the right rate so that when a sony tv sees that sequence of light, infrared light turning on and off and on and off at the right rate, it turns off and makes the world a better place. And then Philips and Panasonic and all these others have different intervals and different ways of blinking light, but it's just infrared light blinking on and off and on and off. So an interesting thing about LEDs is you can control the brightness with the amount of current. So with the speed of the electrons going through it. Um, so if the electrons are going through it slowly, very little current, then the, it'll emit photons, so you'll see light coming out, but it'll be very dim. We can, put, we can push on with more volts or less resistance with the same volts, more current through the LED to make it brighter and brighter and brighter with more and more current until the magic smoke goes away. Mm and it will never light up ever again. So we usually don't want to do that. And in order to guarantee that we don't do that, we almost always put a resistor in line with the LED to guarantee that the LED will be a certain brightness and will never burn up. Okay, so that's a resistor in line with, and it doesn't matter if it's on the plus side or the minus side. It's the same circuit again. Remember the, the happy person in the mud bath can be anywhere in the circle? Same with this, it can be the plus side or the minus side. Um, and um, um, it, electrical engineers and their insecurities again, we have different words. So two parts, in, in line with you. We don't call that in line. In electronics, we call that in series. It can be two or more parts, all in a line. Those are parts in series with one another. So if you play with electronics, you'll hear that word. And two or more parts across are, are called in parallel. Mm -hmm. 
And if you play with electronics, you'll hear that too. Okay, so here's a resistor in series with an LED. It happens to be on the long lead. Do you remember if the long lead is plus or minus? Plus. Plus. Yeah. Longer is plus. Um, a positive thing to be long, I guess. So, um, so there it is. How do you make the LED light up? Right now, it's not lit up because there's no energy. There's no electrons flowing through it to make it work. We have to have a power supply pushing the electrons through the LED to make it light up. Okay, and the, it's quantum physics, which is totally bizarre stuff, uh, to make that light up. Um, it goes through there, it's called exciting the, uh, the semiconductor material, and then it, uh, gets, it, it, it absorbs energy, and then it lets go of the energy and puts out a photon. It does that zillions of times a second, and we perceive that as photons hitting our eyeballs, which looks like light for our little brains. Um, what color is it? Well, it depends on how they manufactured it. We don't know what color this LED is yet till we let, make it light up. So how do we make it light up? Well, we've got a power supply with a black and a red wire. Right now, you can see that the power supply is off. You can see the switch is off. That's always a good idea when the power supply, when you're hooking it up to your circuit the first time, you have it off. So it's off. We have the black wire is going to go somewhere, and the red wire is going to go somewhere. <clears throat> and this is to answer uh, your question now, uh, at least in part, for this particular circuit to make an LED light up. Where do we put the black wire? Well, you have a 50-50 chance here. We've got the black wire going to one place. It can be either the short minus wire or the right side of the resistor, which is in series with the long positive wire. Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah. <laughs> You're right. So we want to have that on the short wire because we have to have the minus side of our LED be negatively charged and the long positive wire, the long positive side of the diode be positively charged so that the electrons are sucked across the diode junction, as they call it in semiconductor physics, um, so that the current flows in the direction it can flow, and thus emit photons, which we'll, we will perceive as light. So here we go. Um, the switch is off when we hook it up, so we'll hook up the uh, black and the uh, red wire. There's the red wire going to its proper place toward you know, there's a resistor in series, but it's hooked up towards the positive wire. And the black goes towards the minus short wire uh, lead. Okay, now we'll turn the power supply on green, as it turns out. And the electrons are flowing. That's the little dotted yellow lines. The electrons go out of the black wire into the short lead through the LED, making it uh, emit photons uh, through the... Uh, resistors in series so no magic smoke goes away so it's only flowing at a certain rate getting sucked back into the batteries to be recycled through the battery chemistry out the black wire again and around through the LED through the resistor and back sucked into the batteries recycled around and around and around and around it's a continual outpouring of electrons getting sucked back in and a continual outpouring of photons coming out that we perceive of as green light mm -hmm. So you either turn off the switch or the battery chemistry wears out and there's not enough energy anymore. So that's our first circuit. Mm -hmm. And that's the way an LED works. Kind of cool? Yeah. And when you turn the LED off, uh, the power supply off, the LED turns off. Okay, so let's look at... Um, Another one. So here in my hand is an LED. And it's kind of hard to see here. Uh, and I don't know you, so I can't really tell. Where's my um, camera? Um, 
it's down here. Okay, so I don't know if you can see. Can you see that there's a long and a short lead here? Yeah. Yeah. Kind now, of. so the short lead is minus, and now I've got um, like the sh picture shows there. I've got one of these kind of batteries, and uh, just take my word for it. On this side of the battery, there's a plus sign, and it also says three V. So that means there's three volts here. That's enough volts to make this LED light up. And um, this side's plus, the shiny side, and then this side here is the minus side. So I want to hook up the LED so that, and, and like, what color is this? You can't tell. There's no color on the plastic. Usually, or quite often anyways, there's a colored plastic to show you the human what color the LED will light up. But this one doesn't have that. Well, we'll find out really soon what color this is. So there's a long and a short lead. I'll hook up the plus on the plus side uh, and the minus short lead on the minus side. And oh, look, it's, it's amber. They call that yellowish, goldish. Mm -hmm. OK, so that's an LED actually lighting up. But I cheated here. I don't have a resistor in series to ensure to guarantee no magic smoke goes away. Um, but the LED did not burn up. And that's because these kind of batteries are called coin cells because they're kind of a shape of a quarter or a euro coin in, in Europe. Um, because of the chemistry involved in manufacturing these, there is an internal resistance. That's not there purposefully, but it is there. And that resistance, I know, is enough to guarantee that this LED does not burn up. It just it shines really bright. And you can see it's directional. So I, um, as I move it back and forth, you can see it gets brighter and dimmer as it gets pointed towards the camera or not. Mm -hmm. LEDs are directional. They have a lens at the top here to focus the light, and some are very sharply focused, some are very broadly focused. You can buy LEDs with all sorts of qualities. What happens if you hook this up wrong way? Anyone want to guess? Well, you said it's a diode, so it only yeah. lets it go one way. Yeah, so it won't work. So yeah. there it is. It's not lit up. Um, but it, it actually, because of that internal resistance, it doesn't hurt the diode. So I can just hook it up the right way again, and now it works again. You don't want to do that with a battery pack with four and a half volts with AA batteries, because then the LED will light up super bright for a fraction of a second, probably too fast for us to even see, and then the magic smoke goes away, and we'll, it'll never light up again. Um, if we have a resistor in series, though, no problem. Uh, a, a, a resistor with enough resistance. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, so there's there's a, a circuit in con concept, and then one in that I actually held in my hands that you could see. Um, we're going to do the same exact circuit again, except with an infrared LED. There it is on the screen. There's the black wire going to the short minus lead, the red wire going through a resistor so no magic smoke goes away to the long plus lead and the power supply is on. So that LED, that infrared LED, is actually shining super bright infrared light out into space. It's just we can't see it because our eyeballs don't respond to it. If we could, um, we can't, we could turn that LED on and off with this switch, on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off at just the right intervals so that it puts out an off code for a Sony TV. So if it were shining at a, a Sony TV, it would turn the TV off and make the world a better place. <laughs> so, um, um, but we can't do that because the intervals are too small and they need a lot of accuracy and it, it, it's just mechanically not possible. But a microcontroller can be programmed to do that if this circuit was not powered directly from the power supply, but instead was powered from a pin of the microcontroller programmed 
with those intervals to turn it on and off and on and off at just the right rate to turn a Sony TV off. And that's what a TV gone does. And then it does different intervals for Philips and then different intervals for uh, uh, Panasonic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that, that's, that's what we're going to be getting through. But when it's on, um, it um, makes the electrons flow just the same as the green one. We just can't see it. Um, so yeah, a code for infrared remote control is just infrared light turning on and off and on and off at particular intervals. And it can be used not just for TVs, but to control left, right for a remotely controlled car or whatever you want to do. So, um, let's see. Here is a video of TV Be Gone. So, um, if you push the button on the TV Be Gone, you can see a little red light blinking. Every time that little red light blinks, that's an infrared remote control code coming out the infrared, remote, uh, the infrared LED. And you can see it flickering because my video camera on my phone, which I did this video with, is not very good. It does not filter out infrared light like our eyeballs do. So every time the, uh, the flickering on that infrared light, uh, we can see that's a different off code. Mm. The red light is only there because we humans can't see the infrared, so it's just there to tell you, the human, that the TV be gone is working. It's trying to turn TVs off. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of off codes that uh, took me a year and a half of my life to, co to collect and program into a microcontroller to control that LED to turn TVs off. <clears throat> of course, it's open source. No one has to take a year and a half of their life to do that ever again. It's all online. You can download it, do whatever you want with it. You can get no more new off codes as new TVs come out. Um, every year and a half, there's like a handful more that I add to it. So, um, but it takes about a minute to go through all the different off codes. And then it turns off waiting for you to push that button again, and then it'll go through that whole sequence again of Sony, Philips, Panasonic, Fujitsu, Toshiba, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's how TV Gone works. Cool. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's just go through a few more parts and then some detail uh, uh, with a controlling program. <clears throat> There's just a few more parts. So um, these are capacitors. Capacitors are like little buckets for electrons. And um, these little buckets, uh, th those are actually like teeny, teeny little batteries. They can charge much quicker than a battery, but they also discharge much, much quicker than a battery. <clears throat> there's little ones and there's big ones. The little ones charge up quicker and discharge quicker. The big ones charge up slower because it takes a while for them to fill and they discharge slower. Um, the ones on the right are the big ones, the ones on the left are little ones. <clears throat> the ones on the left the leads are the same length. It doesn't matter which way you put them in. They're not polarized. The ones on the right, they're little, like little cans. They're usually black, but sometimes they're yellow or blue or other colors. It doesn't matter the color. The value is written. It's printed on it. And, uh, but the ones on the right have long and a short lead. Because of the chemistry and the manufacturing process, there is a minus and a plus side. And the short lead, just like LEDs, is minus. So it does matter how you connect them. Mm -hmm. Capacitor, uh, the amount of charge they can store, the, the, the amount, you know, how big the bucket is, is measured in farads, named after Michael Faraday, another dead physicist. Ads. Okay, here's a, another part which is super simple. They're just pieces of metal which are connected or not. So take a look at my fingers here. Um, a push button switch is like this. This is a piece of metal and this is a piece of metal. When you push the button, it pushes the two pieces of metal together 
to connect, and now the switch is on. But there's a spring in it, so that when you let go of the button, it pops up. And now the switch is off. So you can go on, off, on, off, on, off. Um, so that's a, the push button switch, which is on the lower left. And also um, sort of in the, um, um, in the middle there. So um, there's also switches that are, uh, you can do go like this, and then the, the, it, it keeps it down, not with a spring, but it keeps pushing it. And then you do it the other way, and it pulls it away. There's also ones that are slide switches. And there's ones that can work for, uh, like for lights in your room. Um, those are called toggle switches, just like these little ones here. So switches, they're easy. Just pieces of metal touching or not. And then the coolest, the coolest part is a microcontroller, which is um, hundreds of thousands of transistors. And I'll show you transistor at the end. Um, but they are connected together in such a way that it creates a computer, which is a complete computer on a chip, which can run a program. You can connect parts to its pins and then put a program in its memory to control those parts. OK? I got I've a question. Through that already. Question, uh, yeah. how close are we to an open source Arduino 328P chip? Is anyone doing We're it? Not very close. Yeah, there are people now working on it, which is really cool. There's an open source uh, chip called an FPGA, which have software configurable transistor circuits inside. So you can have blocks of transistors that do certain functions. And with software, you can connect those blocks together in various ways um, to do lots of incredible things, including a microcontroller. Um, I'm not going to get it much into that uh, today, but there are now open source FPGA chips. And there's open source software for configuring them. And that is the basis for uh, a laptop, which is uh, a, a, a Kickstarter project or a crowdsource, one of these kind of things, um, 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 crowdsource kind of um, uh, funded projects. Uh, and I can't remember the name now of the laptop, but a completely open source laptop. It's kind of expensive, and it's not as good as one you can buy, but it's from what, what people are telling me, it's really, really good. And it's all open source. And there's no data being collected without your uh, permission, <laughs> and, uh, as long as you're not on the internet. <laughs> hmm. So, um, and that's another story. So it's a really cool uh, uh, beginning. Yeah. But uh, 18 mega 328, as far as I know, no one's created one of those that's completely open source. But it's kind of close, because in China, there are people copying uh, all sorts of chips. And even though there's no open source license, the people who make them do share all these different aspects of the uh, electronics ecosystem. In China, they do share with one another, because it's advantageous for all of them to do it. And it, they do have it online, but you have to be able to read and write in Chinese. <laughs> So it's kind of open source. So the Arduino clones that you buy online um, have um, these are AT Mega 328P copies, even though they don't say that they're copies, because there's no way that they can't be, because the whole Arduino board is three euros, and um, the the chip itself is is way more than that, even in large quantities. Uh, they're they're like uh, seventy cents, but whatever. So. Um, Here's an 18 mega 328P. It says so right on it. It's printed there. You can put, you can put that in a search engine and say data sheet. Um, and then it'll give you uh, a data sheet with 250 pages full of information about this chip. And you can also do that for LEDs to see its various qualities if you know the part number. They're not printed on there. So when you buy an LED, it's good to make sure that you remember the part number or write it down uh, in, or leave it on the bag <laughs> that the LEDs are in or a little drawer. So, um, but the chips have the number printed on it, so you can always look that up. And you don't have to read those data sheets because the people who've created projects with them, uh, as a beginner anyways, you don't have to. 
the people who've created projects have either made use of other people reading it with the projects they downloaded or they did it and it already works. If you play with projects enough, you'll eventually have to read a data sheet and it can get kind of complicated, but a lot of stuff is easy, like knowing which pin is which. Okay. So that's question. a question. Yes. So are you saying, that, so the Chinese guys are actually cloning, so with their fab, their proprietary fab, fab infrastructure, they are actually making the, the chips, the Arduino chips? Uh, yeah, yeah, 18 mega 328 P's are, yeah. are copied. Okay. So any chip can be copied. You, um, with acid, you can melt away the, um, the ceramic or plastic cover to uh, expose the semiconductor. And then layer by layer, you can use an electron scanning microscope to look at what's going on there and then re recreate it. And that's what they've done. So chips that are popular enough that they can make money from, they will. <laughs> and they do. And they are. <laughs> hmm. Their, tech, their so, technique is actually scraping it and looking at it with a scanning electron microscope? That's actually what they do? That's what they do. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And um, there's talks of this. So there, there's, um, there's some really, you know, if you're into it, there's um, really cool... Uh, hacker conferences that have been around for a long time. There's Hope Hackers on Planet Earth. I'm one of the organizers for that every two years in New York City. We just had it only online this year, just like we're online now here for this. Um, that was in the end of July, beginning of August. Um, and there, all of the talks for all of the years, and it's been going on since 96, are online for free. You can download. And there's lots and lots of different topics and and uh even longer than that uh, has been going on uh the chaos computer club puts on the chaos communications congress this year would have been their 37th going to be online in the end of december um but they've they have also like the same number of talks like over 100 talks and they're all online all the way back to the their first year um and one of the uh, people who's given talks at both talks about opening chips and copying them um, is um, Travis Goodspeed. Um, so if you're interested, you can look up Travis Goodspeed um, uh, on either CCC, Chaos Computer Club, or on Hope, hope.net, hackers on planet earth.net, hacker, uh, hope.net and find his talks. But you can also find talks on zillions of other very, very interesting topics for beginners all the way up to super, super specific technical whiz kind of stuff. And also just on politics and society or music or food or <laughs> lots of interesting stuff. Um, yeah, so back to the microcontroller. All of these pins have specific functions. To find out what they, all of those functions are, you have to read the data sheet, or you can just rely on the project that you can look at for free and download for free online. Um, but um, for today, we'll just consider that all of the pins, except for pin 7 and 8, um, and 9 and 10, which I'll show you later, are um, input pins or output pins. And I'm going to explain that next. But Pin seven and eight are special pins. Those are for power and ground. Um, but you have to know how to call the pins by their numbers. And the data sheet shows you a picture. And this picture I have on my screen right now is from the data sheet. Uh, there's two things that mark a chip. And not all chips have both. But all chips have an indented black dot in one corner. And that's right next to pin one. Many chips, including this one, also have an indented half circle at the top of the chip. In the picture, it's shown at the bottom, but it, that's, that's called the top. And um, that indented chip, uh, uh, that indention, indented half circle uh, to the left of that is pin one. Okay, and then the counting on all chips goes counterclockwise. In this case, there's 28 pins, so it goes from pin 1 in the lower, uh, lower left, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, which I have arrows pointing to, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 
see uh, at the right. And then the other side of the chip has pins too, which you can't see in this picture, but they go just across from pin, across from pin 15, uh, 14 is pin 15. And then it goes down to pin 28, which is across from pin one. So just counterclockwise. Does that make sense? Cool. So pin seven, in order to make this chip work, we connect the red wire to pin seven VCC and we connect the black wire to pin eight ground. And if we do that and turn the switch on the battery pack on, then it's running. Oh, and the data sheet also says that we can use any voltage between 2.7 and 5.5. Less than 2.7, there's not enough energy and it won't work well reliably. More than 5.5, the chip heats up and it, 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 it's, it might break. So any, anything between those voltage though, totally fine. So four and a half volt power supply will work fine. And so here it's connected correctly. Red wire power to pin seven, black wire ground to pin eight, the ground pin and the power supply is on. So this chip now is running a program. We don't know what that program is. And for now, don't worry about how to get the program in there. I'll show you that when we get to the Arduino software, which is, which is what that software does. Um, but for now, just know that it can get there. And even when the chip is brand new and no one's put a program in there, the chip will interpret the random ones and zeros that are in memory as a program and run it. And it will be controlling those pins accordingly to that program. But we don't know what it is and there's no uh, parts connected to the pins, so nothing cool is happening. But we can connect parts to those pins, either with a solderless breadboard or soldering, um, and then we can put a program into this microcontroller to control those parts. And then if we did everything correctly, it'll do something cool and it'll change our world. And it, that's the magic. So that's how you turn on, a, you know, you power a microcontroller and turn it on. But all of those other pins have to be connected to things. So we have to know what input pins and output pins are. I'm going to talk about output pins first because they're easiest to explain first. And once you know that, and that's easy, then you'll see that input pins are also easy. So output pins. Um, oh, before I get to that, just to be aware, there are two kinds of electronics. Um, there's analog and digital. With digital electronics, which is what we use with computers, things are either on or off. On means power supply voltage. And in our case, if we're using the battery pack, that means four and a half volts. So it's either four and a half volts, or ground, zero volts. Those are the only choices. Power supply or ground. That's it. Two choices. With analog, which is what things were uh, all the way from the beginning of electronics until computer electronic computers were invented, uh, means any voltage is possible. Any current is possible as well. So you have um, four and a half volts, and you have ground, zero volts, but you can also have one volt, two volt, three volt, but you can also have 3.1476322 volts. Any voltage between ground and power is okay with analog. I'm not going to talk any more about analog today, though. Uh, digital is way easier to learn, and computers use digital, so we can do so, so, so much with it. And again, insecure electrical engineers, uh, on and off, power and ground, uh, low and high, uh, zero and one, these are all different words for the exact same thing. And they're all used interchangeably. And everyone who uses this a lot uses them all. Um, so you'll hear me using these words. But it just means there either is voltage or there isn't. Or there is current or there isn't. So high on one power, ground low off zero. Those are all the same, okay? On or off, on or high or low. Okay, back to this, output pin. How do we make a pin and output pin? Well, now we get to our program. 
It's just one line in our program. And that line of our program says, yo, microcontroller, make a pin and output pin. And we tell it what pin, and I'm just arbitrarily showed on the screen, we're gonna make pin 13 an output pin. We can do any of the other pins too, but I just chose pin 13. So the line in our program, one line says, yo, microcontroller, pin 13 is now an output pin. Now it's an output pin. And it stays an output pin for as long as the power is on. Or we can later have a line that says, yo, microcontroller, pin 13, it's now an input pin. You can do that. Usually you just set it as an output pin, usually near the beginning of your uh, controlling program, and then leave it there. But there are applications where you might want to change it. And I've actually done that. Um, but for now, you know, usually you just set it as an output pin and now it can, you can connect an LED to it and turn it on and off with it. Because that, uh, that output pin can be high or low, on or off. And you make that pin, once it's an output pin with one line, the next line or any other line later, you can say, yo, microcontroller, that output pin, pin 13, make it uh, high, make it, turn it on. And then later, you can say, turn it off. And you can do that with very precise timing, if you care about it. Or you can just say, yeah, it's been on long enough. I don't care how long it was. Now turn it off. Um, so, but it's just a line. You have a line for turning it on, a line for turning it off. If it's on, there's voltage on that pin. And if there's voltage on that pin, it can be connected to an LED or anything else and then as long as there's a complete circuit for the electrons to flow in, it flows from the output pin then to ground, then it can turn an electronic part on like an LED and make it light up. And then when you make that pin low off, the LED has no voltage there anymore, so it, no light shines, it's off. And we can do that for as long and short as we want, as accurately as we want. So let's look at the uh, first project with a microcontroller. Uh, and so far, I've only been talking about microcontrollers and not Arduino. Okay, Arduino comes really soon. But um, this is just about electronics, not Arduino in, in, in particular, although this is applicable to Arduino. So uh, are any, any of you uh, software geeks? No? So um, software geeks all know that the first time you put a, a programming language on your uh, software on your computer, the first thing that you do is write the words hello world on your screen. And if you can do that with your new software language, then you know that it's set up correctly and you can do anything from there. The equivalent for hello world with a microcontroller is to make an LED blink. So that's the hello world for microcontrollers, so that's what we're going to do. So um, make an LED blink. So how do we do that? So before we can do that, let's just review really quickly how to do it without a microcontroller. Um, we've got an LED with a long and a short lead. The short lead's minus, connected to the black minus lead of the power supply. The long lead, through a resistor so no magic smoke goes away to the, the long plus loop or to the plus red wire of our power supply, then turn it on and the electrons flow around and around and around and uh, photons are emitted from the LED, in this case green, and it, they flow. And then if you turn the switch off, there's no voltage anymore, so there's no um, electrons being pushed, so no energy, the LED turns off. We can replace the power supply with another power supply. It can be yet another, um, <clears throat> yet another battery pack, exactly the same, and it'll work exactly the same. As long as we have power and ground connected in an appropriate voltage range, the voltage will push the electrons and it will work. So we can do it with the power supply uh, that we had before or we can take that away and use a different power supply. As long as it has a good voltage uh, that, that's appropriate for our circuit 
and um, we hook up plus and minus in the appropriate way. So let's use the pin 13 as our power supply. Pin 13 is a power supply that's controllable on and off, not from a switch, a physical switch, but from our program, our controlling program. Okay, so here's our um, LED again with the black and the red wire, and we hook up pin 13, that's our power supply pin, uh, output pin to red, and ground goes to the ground of our power supply. And now we have two circuits with one power supply. One of our circuits, one circle for electronics, electrons to flow is the power supply on the left going through pin seven and eight and around and around inside of the microcontroller and back recycled through the batteries and around and around that way. The microcontroller do its thing to run programs and control pins uh, with parts connected to them. The other circle is the power supply through the microcontroller through pin 13 through the LED and resistor back to ground of the power supply and around and around that way. Two totally separate circles that are related. Two circuits. So we can have lots of them because each output pin or an input pin later can be its own circuit, all controlled by our program, our controlling program in the microcontroller. Um, cool, so um, we can have a program to make that output uh, pin 13 an output pin, turn it on, and then turn it off, and that makes our LED blink. So let's look at that. This is the hardware of our Hello World. Um, yeah, again, i just showing we can make uh, different power supplies to make the LED work. This is the hardware, and it's called hardware because parts are hard. You can, um, you can, <laughs> you can make sounds with it. It's hard. You can touch them. Um, software running on bigger computers is far away from the hardware. You can't really touch it. So that's called software. The program inside of a microcontroller um, is closer to the hardware, not as far away as software. So it's between hard and soft, and it's actually called firmware. That's the technical term. So the program in a microcontroller isn't called software. It's called firmware. And again, I mentioned earlier, in a Arduino, it's called a sketch because <laughs> that isn't supposedly isn't scary for non-geeky artists all right so what about our firmware well I already told you about what it is so the first thing we do it's a very very short program the first line is yo microcontroller pin 13 is now an output pin so now it's an output pin that's the one our LEDs connected to and uh, then the next line is yo microcontroller make that output pin high now there's voltage there and the, the electrons go out, uh, um, um, out, out the microcontroller through the uh, LED and resistor and uh, back to the power supply and around and around and around and around and it, and it lights up because there's voltage there pushing electrons, there's current, the LED um, emits photons, it's on. In this case, it's red. Okay. Then we go, yo, microcontroller, pin 13, that output pin, make it low. Now it's zero volts. There's no voltage there. There's no push. There's no electrons going. There's no energy going through the LED. Um, there's no photons coming out. It's off. So that's Hello World. Kind of cool? Yeah. fast. This one is considered really slow, um, but it goes 16 million times a second. Mm -hmm. So in the case I just showed you, it will turn the LED on for a 16 millionth of a second, which is too slow for our eyeballs to perceive light before it turns off again. So what we want to do is after we turn the LED on, making the output pin high, we want to delay a while and then turn it off. So 
Um, let's do that. We need a delay. We'll just add a delay into there. And now it is. So on the left uh, of this picture, same exact hardware, but now we have the shown in these four lines, and that's the complete uh, program. Make it an output pin. We make the output pin high to turn the LED on. We wait a while, like a second or whatever we want, and then we make it low. If we want to, we can then wait another while with another delay and then loop back to the top. We don't have to make it an output pin again. It's already an output pin. We can just make the LED high again and then wait a while and then turn it off, wait a while and then loop back to making it high and then the LED blinks on and off and on and off like this one. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's that's really it. So that's how microcontrollers work, and um, you know, it's it's actually easy and it's way fun. Um, Arduino makes doing all of this easy because it makes it easy to connect parts ends and it makes it easy to put a program in. But there's let's let's just continue now. The first time you make an LED blink is pretty exciting, but after a few seconds. It's boring because <laughs> it's just an LED blink. <laughs> so let's let's hack on this Hello World program to make it more interesting. Um, but first, um, um, there's uh, just uh, three more parts I, I want to show you um, that you'll need to know. So this is a crystal. Uh, this is what tells the microcontroller exactly how fast to go. Um, and there's um, inside of the microcontroller is some circuitry called an oscillator, which controls the speed of the instructions. The internal oscillator goes at 8 million times a second, um, and um, it's not super accurate. If we want good accuracy, which we need to turn TVs on and off um, uh, reliably, which of course we want to do because we need to turn TVs off, remember? And um, then we need something called a crystal or the next part I'll show you. Um, but a crystal is super accurate, and you can get more and more and more accurate by getting, uh, by paying more and more money. Um, for our purposes, we don't need super accurate. Um, crystals, little crystals like this are, are fairly inexpensive. Uh, this one's 16 million times a second. And um, uh, times per second is called um, hertz, um, named after, um, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, I forget his first name. But anyways, um, uh, he's a dead physicist. So that just means times per second. And it's uh, in this case, it's million times a second, which is megahertz, uh, 16 megahertz. And this next part is a cheaper part, but works uh, just as well if we don't need high accuracy. So this, for a TV to turn off reliably, we can do that with um, a, a ceramic resonator, which is shown here. And it's just a lot of uh, resistors and capacitors connected together inside of there. There's three leads. Uh, the two outside ones are like the two leads of a crystal. Oh, I wanted to talk about a crystal just, just a little more. Um, uh, inside of here is actually a quartz crystal. It's an actual quartz crystal precision cut so that when you put volt it's at 16.000 million times a second, 16 megahertz. Um, and the, um, together with the uh, oscillator circuitry in the microcontroller, the ceramic resonator does the same electronics function. There's nothing physically vibrating though. Um, so those two outside leads connected to the microcontroller and the middle one connected to ground will do the same thing. It costs less money, it's less accurate, but it's accurate enough for our purposes. Okay, so uh, yeah, and again, this is measured in Hertz. Um, what was his name? Helmholtz or something like that? Anyways, um, so. Um, question, yeah. question. If you, yeah. if you don't have the crystal at all, can you get like one se a one second blink or you, you need something? Um, 
Uh, the microcontroller has a built-in oscillator, and if you're okay with 8 megahertz oscillation, that's not very accurate. And if you're just blinking an LED slowly, you don't need accuracy, and then you don't need that extra part. For an Arduino, though, we also need a, a ceramic resonator or a crystal for enough accuracy to be able to communicate with it from our uh, laptop or oh, tablet okay, so we can yeah. program it. Because um, that takes some fairly accurate uh, timing as well. But if we had so it Arduino programmed, sorry, if we had it programmed already, we can do a simple thing like, like a one second blink if it were programmed already. No problem. Yes. Okay. Okay. You can definitely do that. Um, so it's uh, it's a little bit weird though because um, um, so so this is an aside. Don't worry about if this makes sense or not for everybody. Um, there's certain parts of the microcontroller chip here um, which you have to program in a special way, and those are called fuse bits. And that reconfigures some of the hardware to be a little bit different. So you have to tell it whether you want the microcontroller to use its internal 8 megahertz oscillator, or there's also an internal 125 kilohertz, much, much slower oscillator, or if you want to use a ceramic resonator or crystal. So if you want to um, blink an LED, you can program the chip to blink an LED without the ceramic resonator. Um, and then you put it into your circuit um, without the ceramic resonator. You have to make sure that while it's in your programming environment, you do the fuse bits correctly. So if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. There's always, always, always more you can learn. No matter how much you know, there's way more to learn. Um, but you don't have to know all this stuff in order to do lots and lots and lots of incredibly cool stuff just with what I'm showing you today. Um, you know, I've been doing this all my life, and there's still way more I can learn, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, and that's one of the things that makes playing with electronics really cool. And, um, and one, one of the things I love about microcontrollers is it's hardware and software, because you have to have a controlling program and the, and the hardware. Um, so it just it brings all these worlds together. It's just, it's just really awesome. So anyways, um, let's hack on Hello World. <clears throat> And, and I'm not going to draw wires on, um, on the screen anymore. Uh, the pictures won't have all the wires because it gets kind of messy. But you can just imagine, rather than having just one output pin, we can have two. One is connected, as, as shown here, just like before with Hello World, to pin 13 to a red LED. And then another pin, and I'll, I'll just say, let's yeah. use pin 3. Um, is connected to an infrared LED to control blinking an infrared LED. And of course, it's an LED, so we want to ensure that um, no magic smoke goes away, so we put a resistor in series with it. And it does not matter which wire we connect that resistor to, remember that. I just happen to do it to the, the long plus lead, um, just just kind of a lot, most people do with that, but it doesn't have to. To blink the infrared LED on and off and on and off to be a uh, off code for a Sony. And then it can blink the that the TV be gone is working. Then it can blink the infrared LED on pin three on and off and on and off to be an off code for a Philips and then just blip the red LED so we know it's working, and then blip, uh, make the infrared LED on pin 3 go on and off and on and off to be the right rate to turn off a Panasonic, and then blip the red LED, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for Toshiba, uh, Fujitsu, Samsung, LG, and all those other TVs, so it turns off all the TVs. And that is the hardware for TV Be Gone. It's actually just a hack of Hello World. But the thing is, it doesn't tell you, it, 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 it's, we have to tell the microcontroller when to do that. Otherwise, if it's being run by batteries, it's gonna make the batteries go dead because, and it's just in our pocket or whatever, or in a drawer uh, because we're not even out in the world where we, 
and of course we don't have a, a TV and we need to turn off at home because it's already off. Um, but, uh, or, <laughs> or better than, better yet, like for me, I don't even have one. So, um, uh, but we wanna tell it when to do that, otherwise we waste energy. So for that, for that we need an input pin. Did someone have a question? Okay, so let's add an input pin. And an input pin, just like an output pin, we just say, pick a pin, like pin two, and we'll say, yo, microcontroller, pin two, that's one line in our program, it doesn't matter where it is, one of the lines, it can be line five, it can be line 10,003. Um, it just says, yo, microcontroller, pin two is an input pin, and now it is. And then once it's an input pin, then we can ask the microcontroller with another line that just says, um, yo, microcontroller, look at pin two. It's digital, so we know it can only be high or low. So we can say, yo, microcontroller, right now is pin two high or low? And then it'll report back with what it is. If the uh, hardware is configured like on the screen now with a black wire connected directly to ground, to pin two, uh, our input pin, and we ask the microcontroller right now, look at pin two and report back, it'll report back low. Likewise, we can hook the red wire, uh, a red wire from pin two, our input pin to the red power wire, which is also powering the microcontroller. Um, that's okay. And if we ask the microcontroller right now, with one line, just, yo, microcontroller, pin two, is it high or is it low? It'll report back high like this. And I just want to point out the color of the wire is just plastic coating. That has nothing to do with the electronics. Again, that's just for us, the humans, to have some idea. And if we have lots and lots of wires, it's easier to see. But again, it's just sort of convention. Um, it can be green, purple, pink, it doesn't matter. Um, is what happens if there's no wire on pin two, and we say, yo, microcontroller, right now, instruction pin two, is it high or is it low? Different microcontrollers can be configured in different ways, and you have to read the data sheet, but in this one, I already know, if you tell it so when nothing is connected to it, that's called floating high. There's a built-in resistor connected to all of the pins, which pull it high when nothing's connected to it. So if we ask it right now, if the microcontroller is high or low, it will report back high. So these are the two choices for an input pin. We can connect it directly to uh, high or low, but when we want to have it an input pin for a switch, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, um, it'll be either connected to ground, like on the left, directly, or it'll be floating high. It's floating high when I'm not pushing the button, but it, when I push the button, it makes it low. Because when I push the button, it'll be connected to ground. I'll show you that in a sec. Here it is. Okay, so remember a switch is these two pieces of metal. They're either open when I'm not pushing the button, or when I'm pushing the button, it connects the two pieces of metal together. And then I let go and a spring makes it pop up. Okay, so when I'm not pushing the button, it's just as if the switch does not exist. So look at the picture on the screen. The yellow wire goes to pin two, our input pin, and it's going to one side of the switch. When I'm not pushing the button, that yellow wire is not connected to anything. So if I ask the microcontroller right now, without pushing the button, if I ask the microcontroller right now with this one line saying, yo, microcontroller, look at pin two right now, is it high or is it low? What will it report back? Nobody knows? Hi. Hi. It's floating, not connected to anything. So it reports back high. But now, if I push the button, the yellow wire is, I'm pushing the button, the yellow wire is connected to the black wire now because the two pieces of metal are connected. Here's the yellow.
Here's the black wire. The yellow and black wires are connected. Oh, that's a cat. <laughs> Okay, sorry, kitty cat. Um, so the yellow wire is here and the black wire is here. If I push the button, they're two connected. The yellow and the black wire are connected. So the yellow wire is connected to the black wire and then the black wire goes to ground. So while I'm pushing the button, the black wire is connected to pin two. Pin two is connected to ground. When I let go, Pin two isn't connected to anything, so it's floating high. When I push down, it's connected to ground, it's low. Let go, it's floating high. Push down, it's ground. So I can have the program look at pin two and then continually look at pin two until it sees it go low. When it's low, I know someone's pushing the button and then I can do something as a result. Okay, so um, that's that's uh, how TV Begun works, and that's how we can tell it when to do its thing. Uh, on the left is the hardware, and I described that already. We have the visible red LED, it doesn't matter what color it is, the invisible infrared LED. Each of them have a resistor in series, so no magic smoke goes away. I have an, a switch between uh, pin 2 in ground, the LED uh, visible is on pin 13 in ground, the invisible infrared is on pin 3 in ground. The um, <clears throat> controlling firmware is written on the right side. So we have the three top lines just initialize everything, so we have our two output pins and input pin. And then we have the part of the program that is waiting for us to push the button. Um, it's just like, look at pin two, is it high or low? If it's high, we have to wait. If it's low, then we can go to the rest underneath. And um, the uh, that just does what I already said. Blip the visible LED so we know it's working and then blip the invisible LED on and off and on and off so it puts out a Sony off code and then blip the visible LED and then go back to the vis invisible LED, blip it on and off and off the right right to make a off code for Panasonic, Philips, Toshiba, Fujitsu, LG, Samsung, etc, 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 etc. And then it does all the codes which takes up to a minute because there are a lot of TVs that need to be turned off but that's okay. It does them all. And, um, uh, and then it actually does something at the bottom, which it puts the microcontroller into what's called a uh, low power mode. And then when you push the button, it wakes up the microcontroller so that it can do the rest again and turn TVs off again. So that's how TV Begun works. It's just a hack of Hello World. Um, it's not even all that much more complicated. The only hard part was taking a year and a half, a year and a half of my life to collect all the off codes. So, um, and it turns out that was fun. And it took lots and lots and lots of field testing, but it turns out that was fun too. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool project. So now that you have, you know, and again, that was a lot of information. So you don't have all of that totally solid in your mind right now, but you have, I hope, a feel for how all of this works. And so I hope you can feel confident enough to download other projects online. But I do want to say that, because there's one more part coming, that this is not all of TVB Gone, because this, what I showed you, does work, but it won't turn off TVs from very far away, because um, output pins and input pins all have uh, microcontrollers. Uh, all, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by a cat. Um, all have resistors um, on their pins. So that limits the current that can push electrons through the LEDs. So the infrared LED won't be very bright. The infrared LED will turn TVs off, but not only from about a meter away. And we want to turn TVs off from far away. So in order to do that, we need one more part, which is a transistor. And a transistor is a current amplifier. It will take the small amount of current that the, um, that the, um, 
uh, output pin is capable of giving and amplify it to a large amount of current to make the infrared LED turn on and off very brightly. So, um, um, yeah, and again, LEDs get brighter and brighter and brighter with more and more current. And we want to make sure we limit it so the magic smoke doesn't go away. So to do that, we need um, a transistor. And here's a transistor. This is from a data sheet. This transistor's name is 2N3904, but there are a lot of different ones at work. Transistors are very, very interesting, fascinating quantum devices that don't work with um, uh, uh, classical physics. Uh, but according to quantum, they're particles that don't, they're devices within which particles that don't exist flow through barriers they can't cross. So I'm not going to talk about quantum anymore because it's too bizarre, but it's fascinating to study, and I did that for way too long. And, um, uh, and I definitely still don't understand it. Um, I think it was um, Richard Feynman that says, anyone who claims to understand quantum physics hasn't studied it enough. So anyways, a transistor, though, can just be considered a, a current amplifier. And um, it has three leads. They're technically called emitter, base, and collector, but right now I'm just calling it ground, input, and output. You connect the ground lead to ground. The input pin is going to go through a resistor so no magic smoke goes away to the output, directly to the output pin of the microcontroller. And then the infrared LED goes through a resistor so no magic smoke goes away to the output pin of the transistor and the other side of the LED goes to power supply. And then the infrared LED will turn on and off and on and off at a very bright, uh, it'll be very, very bright and then we'll be able to turn off TVs from almost 10 meters away. So here's the exact same thing, nothing changed in the firmware, but the hardware now has just one transistor and one extra resistor for the input pin. And that's it. And so, um, that is everything you need to know about electronics.